Arto Laitinen is professor of philosophy at the University of Tampere. Um, I, 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 I could tell that I, I learned to know Arto uh, when we were both fellows at the Helsinki Collegium for Radboud study about 10 years ago. And I learned to know Arto as the most open-minded and, and, and scholarly philosopher who was always ready for, for dialogue and, and, and collaboration. And I'm very happy, Arto, that, that you are now, now uh, also in this situation. I can hear you. Uh, Arto is specialist in, in, in recognition theory, recognition theory uh, in the philosophy of Charles Taylor, Axel Honneth and, and, and Hegel. And, and his work is not only scholarly, uh, but he's also, uh, as a philosopher, he's also engaged in understanding the big contemporary social dilemmas. And I think particularly important is Arthur's uh, current work on ethics of, of robotics and ethics of artificial intelligence. intelligence. But today, uh, I think we could say that Arthur is going to the, to the basics Really, this is not about robotics or artificial intelligence or how, how well we will see, but the topic is how recognition from others shapes the self. So please, Art. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation and uh, for giving me the chance to... Um, oops. Talk about something that I... Uh, one of my favorite favorite topics so the title is how recognition from others uh, shapes the self. And um, without further ado, let's start with the introductory comment. Uh, I will be talking about how recognition shapes various of self phenomena as they can perhaps uh, uh, be called and not so much about how recognition shapes one thing that is called the self. So I approach uh, selfhood by a variety of phenomena. Uh, here I just listed uh, some of them. I won't touch uh, all of them <laughs> in this talk now. But I do not think that it's necessarily fruitful uh, to start with the assumption that the self is some sort of entity that we can, whose nature we can we can discover. I mean, it can be some kind of entity, but definitely not separate entity from from the human person. So when we talk about self-determination and so on, we are talking about the self-determination of the human person or self-consciousness of the human person. So when writing this uh, talk, I encountered this 60s song, which kind of illustrated um, this kind of redundant reification of something. Uh, the title of the 60s song is I just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. So similarly as here that my condition is somewhat uh, redundant, uh, possibly uh, ontologizing the self is redundant. I'm open to, su to the suggestions that we can actually give a meaningful answer to the metaphysics of the self as one entity, but I won't be engaged in that project here. And similarly, as there is a multiple of uh, a multiplicity of self phenomena or selfhood phenomena, phenomena related to selfhood, there are also multiple roles that recognition from others could play. So that's the plot then of uh, today's talk. I will go through some of these uh, phenomena and illustrate how recognition from others plays a different role in relation to these uh, different phenomena. So instead of a need answer of how the re how recognition one thing shapes the self another thing it's a bit of a mess i'm i'm afraid so the contents is uh, are as such i will start with the notion of personhood uh, and universal recognition of anyone merely the fact that the one is a person or recognizing that person as a person. Uh, and here it seems that there are three good candidates what the role of recognition might be. And I will be arguing that actually recognition has all those three roles. It's both responsive and constitutive and it's a developmental precondition. And the explanation for that is 
that personhood has kind of three aspects and these three aspects are uh, related to recognition each in its unique way. So um, among the aspects of personhood are various capacities and the capacity to be self-conscious uh, is one of the important marks of being a person as it were. And there's a famous claim by Hegel that self-consciousness exists only as recognized. So the second section of my talk will comment on that without going to Hegel scholarship. And it, the suggestion is that here we have a fourth type of uh, role that recognition plays uh, on top of the three, uh, three uh, roles mentioned in the first section. Uh, and then we get um, to more concrete things. These are pretty abstract, the first two uh, sections. Uh, for example, Axel Honneth and the debates on recognition of the last three decades, um, they build a lot on this idea that a human person's self-respect is shaped by uh, respect from others. So respect is a one type of recognition here. And self-esteem is shaped by the esteem we get from others. And here, uh, then I again ask that what exactly is the role of recognition here? And here the uh, answer is um, pretty multifaceted. One clear thing that it cannot be directly constitutive. We must be able to distinguish respect from others and self-respect, but what then is it is the question. And then the fourth section continues with the same, uh, same type of question that when we, what is the relation of recognition to our particular identities where identity is in the sense of identity crisis, for example, that we can have uh, uh, practical identities, narrative identities and, and so on. And here my suggestion is that the role of recognition is pretty similar to the one that uh, was already discussed in the previous section then. And I added one slide on half-baked thoughts about self-concern, but the plan is that I'll skip it. And then there's only the conclusions. All right, so universal recognition as a person. So whereas concrete identities uh, concern the question, what kind of person I am or who am I as a person? This concerns merely that I am a person uh, at all. So one of the three aspects that I think that uh, are the kind of standard aspects of personhood, uh, one is the so-called person making capacities. It is in virtue of having these capacities that someone is a person or counts as a person. And among the candidates uh, are such things as self-consciousness, rationality, higher emotions, morality, responsibility, capacity to act as a recognizer of other persons and so on. For humans, it seems contingently to be the case that here all sorts of interaction with others and recognition from others is developmentally relevant for actually developing, actualizing those, uh, those capacities. That when we are born, we are not born adults, as it were. We are born, but we do have these capacities as kind of innate potentials, but they need social interaction to be developed into, uh, into full actuality. This is contingent in that uh, we could have been such a species that we are born adults, or there could be other species that are born adults, or as philosophers like to toy with uh, thought experiments. If there were, were some kind of magic pills that we could give to newborns and they would develop these capacities, then recognition from others wouldn't be necessary, or this kind of very long process of uh, interaction and so on but for human persons, uh, it seems to be. So concerning the person making capacities, it seems like recognition is developmentally relevant. So here's one role that recognition can play. 
another uh, suggestion has been that, well, actually personhood is a bit of a role, just like being a president is a role. And roles you can have only by being recognized as possessing those roles. Someone can be a president only by being recognized as a president. It would be a kind of absurd thought experiment to think that in a community, one of them is a leader, but no one knows who the leader is. We need to sort of know who's, who has the rights to give directions and so on. So it seems that uh, in these cases, uh, recognition is directly constitutive. Being something is being recognized as that thing. And uh, there are good, good points made in favor of relational personhood, that uh, personhood is this kind of uh, standing status or role. That, and there, ontologically, then recognition would be directly constitutive. And we can have a view, okay, I didn't have it there, where both of these are the case, that we need both the capacities and we need uh, recognition. So that it can be both uh, recognition can be relevant in this way for the one aspect and in that way for the other other aspects. Now this raises some worries concerning relativism and the moral standing of persons. Uh, could that be dependent on recognition that merely by not recognizing some human beings as persons, we could rob them of their moral standing? Uh, that's a problem for the relational personhood view, and I think that uh, the result or the way out of this uh, tension is to say that um, moral standing is not dependent on recognition, that uh, adequate moral re recognition is responsive to the moral standing that we have thanks to having, having the uh, capacities. So here we get a third role or third aspect of personhood, uh, which is the moral personhood. And persons have the mor uh, moral personhood. It seems to me we can consistently say that that is had thanks to the capacities, even though recognition is nonetheless uh, relevant for the full ontology of being a person. So we can avoid any dilemmas that there are. I won't go to any details here. Um, but roughly the idea is that capacities ground the moral standings, standing. Recognition is responsive to the moral standing. But in another role, uh, recognition is also relevant for actualizing the capacities. But the capacities need not be actualized. They can be merely potential. Uh, for possessing the moral standing. That's one coherent <laughs> way of thinking about three aspects of personhood and three roles that recognition has in relation to those, those aspects. That's still um, very general. That's merely about the standing as a person in general, where, whereas some other aspects of um, selfhood and recognition will be more particular to what type of person is at stake or which person or who is at stake. But another abstract um, uh, aspect is that of self-consciousness, which is one of the capacities uh, that are relevant for being a person. And Hegel famously started uh, this uh, or uh, continued what Fichte had started, this idea that uh, recognition is relevant to subjectivity or self-consciousness or personhood uh, or something like that. Hegel uh, makes the most famous claim in terms of self-consciousness, uh, saying that it exists only in being recognized. Now, Hegel has uh, special reasons and very complicated argumentative context that I will skip here. It's related to kind of struggles for recognition, which is motivated by, by partial recognition and misrecognition. And then the end state is that of um, mutual recognition. And Hegel says that self-consciousness requires these kinds of relations of uh, mutual recognition between several self-consciousnesses. 
and we can make that kind of understandable outside the uh, special Hegelian con context by thinking something like this, that um, if we think of a consciousness, a mind, a subject on whom it dawns that that subject really has a perspective on the world, so that there's a distinction between myself and the world. When I realize that I have a perspective or maybe am a perspective uh, uh, to the world or on the world, at the moment, that realization carries the realization that there are such things as perspectives uh, on the world. So that the very realization of the distinction, as it were, between the world and the kind of conscious perspective on it. I realized that there are perspectives and I realized that possibly others have those perspectives as well. So that's the weak claim that I at least must understand the possibility that there are others. But then there are stronger claims uh, stating that the very structure of uh, distinction between the mind and world or self and world has a kind of triangular uh, structure that it's mediated by intersubjectivity, that the very idea of objective world uh, uh, on which I have a perspective comes with the distinction between my perspective and other perspectives and a kind of triangulation between those perspectives. And this can be kind of, I think this is a credible claim and can be made credible quite apart from any Hegelian uh, narratives which lead to that. So the claim then is that the relevant structure when this realization dawns on the mind, that it's not merely a kind of ego and a world, but ego, others and the world, or uh, the subject's relation to itself, relation to others and relation to world. So that the minimal structure already has the intersubjective element built into it. That's what it is to be related to a world is uh, one can do it kind of implicitly without realizing the distinction between ego and world. One can simply sort of cope in the world as such entities that are not self-conscious do. But once this kind of self-consciousness dawns, then uh, also the uh, possibility or presence of other subject dawns as well. So in a very colloquial terms, I would put, it this, put this claim so that self-consciousness and recognition form a package. It's kind of package deal. You get one and you get the other as well, necessarily always. So to be self-consciousness, to be self-conscious of oneself as a perspective or subject or whatever terminology is used here, I'm being a bit uh, loose here. It's necessarily structurally such as that to be in relations to present or absent others. So once the intentional structure is there, uh, the others need not be present, but I still have the relationship uh, to the world, which is mediated by this uh, kind of placeholder, to put it this way. So that the structure uh, is such that both me and the other recognize each other as recognizers. We both realize that we have a world and our relation to the world is mediated by, via the other. So that there are, there's a kind of package deal that comes with uh, uh, self-consciousness and recognition. So it's a, a mutual recognition uh, when it's kind of conceptually adequate. But others need not be present. So uh, someone, a Robinson Crusoe trained in civilization will have this kind of intersubjectively mediated relation to the world, even if uh, uh, sort of in complete solitude. But when others are present, then, and once this structure is there, then others have kind of the power to evoke this response of recognizing them. So that it's really, really hard to, I don't know, say, if you're in the wilderness and haven't seen another human person for ages, and then a human person walks 
across to you on the same path. It's really hard to uh, avoid recognizing that other, other person uh, as a person or as a, another self-conscious uh, entity, to put it this way. So uh, this is my loose suggestion then that here recognition kind of forms a necessary part of a structural package that self-consciousness and recognition uh, come together or self-consciousness and intersubjectivity come together and indeed self-consciousness, intersubjectivity and this kind of objectivity come together. Okay, I will uh, march on. This is uh, a bit rapid or quick, I, I realize. Let's now go to the um, uh, sense in which uh, much recognition debate has proceeded in the last three decades, that recognition from others shapes one's practical relations to self. For example, self-respect is shaped by respect that we receive from others, self-esteem is shaped by social esteem, and so on. Sort of experiencing loving concern is the third variant that Honneth lists alongside uh, respect and esteem, and he has slightly different uh, suggestions of what the relevant self-relation there is, something like sense of self-worth or ontological trust or something like that, basic confidence. Now here, um, I think that it's important that this is not a constitutive relationship. We must be able to distinguish social respect from self-respect. Like being a president may be constituted uh, by being recognized as a president. But when others, for example, denigrate me or recognize me as an inferior, I might not sort of swallow without chewing that view and think that no no i'm an equal don't uh, treat me as a as an inferior so that my self-respect and self-esteem are not identical to the social uh, esteem from others so it's important to say that it's not constituted by those in the same in the direct way that you know being a leader of a group is constituted by being recognized uh, as a leader of the group. But it is very um, intimately related anyway. So uh, because they are not the same thing, we have expectations on how others respect or esteem us. We can experience misrecognition and we can struggle against uh, what we consider to be misrecognition. And we can struggle, we can be, of course, wrong in our expectations. We can have inflated expectations and so on. But anyway, if we look at the question, what then is the role of this um, kind of the role of the way others take and treat us? Is it causal? Well, um, I think it's right to say that it is causal, that uh, there can be these kinds of formative experiences that just one communicated, forcefully communicated attitude changes our self-perception. So that there's clearly a causal, I mean, it's, if it's shaping, it must be something causal. But to think, about, think of the relationship as causal relationship uh, gives a pretty passive uh, uh, impression so that uh, the real cause is somewhere outside me, and then I merely passively interiorize uh, uh, the uh, social takes on me. And that's not the case. I can, I need not uh, internalize them. I can, I can protest against them. Also, uh, talk about causal relations suggests that there's a kind of one token event explained by one token event, which sometimes uh, it is. I mean, there are formative experiences. One single experience can change someone's self-perception for good. Now, much better uh, term is dialogical, because it suggests that uh, the subject uh, 
has a say that there's a kind of mediation or translation <clears throat> on how others takes on me are mediated to my own takes on me as it were and as in political philosophy uh, it has been pointed out by uh, Michael Walter and John Rawls that you cannot directly for example state cannot directly distribute self-respect it can only distribute social basis of uh, self-respect and this uh, another improvement from merely saying that there's a token causal relation is to bring into play that uh, the nature of holistic wider background the general attitudinal climate as it were for example a culture of racism how that affects one's self understandings or self <clears throat> self esteem so these social basis of self respect self esteem and so on are important so there's this holism at play not merely token events so that's that kind of gives the background from which we can then um, individuate sometimes a token event that brings about a token change but sometimes uh, there aren't such clear-cut events but it's the self-understanding is kind of formed uh, in this context of wider background the further question is that is this how direct is this when others take and treat me as something philosophers like to call everything he uh, then i think i am he so that's the kind of uh, that's how um, it can go uh, that social respect affects self-respect precisely because it's the kind of same dimension of self-relations and so social relations and so on but there can be a lot of interpretation and hermeneutical uh, uh, hermeneutical activity needed or it can be immediate but nonetheless it can be that I'm treated like this so I think that I am this something else so it need not be direct explicit messages as it were but it can be somehow hints from someone's body language that uh, uh, make me think that uh, I am such and such and this is something also causal relations can they may suggest that just hitting someone in the head with uh, with a, well, i don't know hammer brings about a change in their self relations that can happen but here the social respect is something that we can read it's intelligible there's information in it and it can be kind of testimony epistemic evidence that we should have this kind of self understanding but that may sound too rationalistic because often this emotional influence is more uh, indirect uh, that it's not so clear that why why we in certain company tend to have this sense uh, self kind of sense of inferiority or for example that where does that come from they keep telling telling me the uh, opposite but nonetheless i feel inferior and here i think that uh, psychological research can do a lot to discover the mechanisms on how others takes on me lead to my own takes on me but there is some kind of um, with these qualifications causal <laughs> mechanism at play that it's uh, a certain very special type of uh, influence that is being played and then the last part uh, suggests that these very similar types of mechanisms or similar type of role that rec recognition has uh, will be true of particular identities my answers to who am i my <clears throat> identity in the sense of identity crisis i won't go, go through all of these this kind of sense of identity uh, that is related to the possibility of identity crisis sometimes is discussed as practical identity sometimes as narrative identity or biographical identity sometimes as something like qualitative self-image but what is um, important to all of this is the operation of identification with so that there are some 
ends that I identify with, which constitute my practical identity. It constitutes what I stand for, as it were. And whereas then other desires I might as well lose. I don't care if I lose some of my desires, but some fundamental aims, I think that they are crucial to who I am. And I uh, wouldn't be the same person, as it were, uh, if I would lose those uh, aims. Similarly, there are some life events uh, that are relevant to who I think that I am and various quil features of me, like the number of hairs on my, my head to being good in this or that. Some of them are important and some, some are not. So identifying with something is crucial to the formation of this identity. And this can be illustrated with the uh, idea of gender identity, which is very hotly debated uh, these days. So we can distinguish biological sex from social gender conferred by others, and then gender self-identification. And uh, again, we see that the social recognized uh, or conferred gender cannot be the same as the self-identification. I mean, it cannot be constitutively all there is to it, uh, as it were. We must think that whatever the best theory of gender is, uh, nonetheless, social gender is conce conceptually distinct from gender self-identification. It's not constitutive in the sense that the conferred gender is ipso facto the self-identification, but there can be these struggle for, uh, struggles for recognition, uh, sort of um, willing to be recognized as having this self-identification. So there's uh, all sorts of misgendering or uh, gendering that is disrespectful of one's self-identifications that is possible. So uh, the, this is meant to illustrate that recognition is not directly constitutive of self-identity, but it shapes it in this uh, uh, kind of, in, in these ways that we went through briefly. A minute ago. So this can be divided into a conceptual and normative point related to the relationship of identifications with and recognition. So it seems that conceptually we must say that one's identity is constitutively self-defined, whereas for example one's social gender or one's social labelings and so on are conferred by others and roles typically are conferred by, by others. And there's a normative point, the self-defined identity, one's power and right to define one's identity should be recognized or respected by others, perhaps within some normative limits. So again, we can ask that if, I mean, this sounds pretty individualistic, so where's the sociality in this? How is self-identity dialogical? Well, precisely in the sense that social respect, for example, um, shapes very intimately self-respect. Social genderings may uh, intimately um, shape our self-identifications uh, and so on. So it's dialogical, but not directly constitutive. And here's the bonus slide that I will just skip and go to the conclusion. So recognition is relevant for selfhood phenomena, but how exactly? We have gone through five different answers, three of them already with the, uh, with the example of personhood. Recognition is normatively responsive to personhood. It's developmentally relevant to the actualization of potential capacities of persons. And it's constitutive of the relational aspect of personhood or selfhood. Further, in the cases of self-respect and self-identity, we saw, we saw this kind of shaping that is uh, causal in the dialogical sense and holistic sense, and it's kind of intelligible and interpretable and so on uh, shaping but not constitutive. 
and with the example of self-consciousness, we saw that, uh, or the suggestion was rather, that self-consciousness and uh, recognition are constant or necessary aspects of a structural package deal, as it were. So that concludes my uh, very quick uh, running through the, some phenomena, some selfhood phenomena and some roles that recognition can, can play. So uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>